back to another episode of Cold Red. I'm Ray Carr, and with me always is Fitz. Fitz, how are you tonight? Not always, Ray. I wasn't there last week. Thanks for filling in when I had COVID. Well, glad to have you back, Fitz. Good today, to be back. Today, we have a special guest with us, retired supervisory special agent with the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, and is widely considered to be one of the pioneers of the famed profiling unit, <laughs> Greg McCrary. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ray. I appreciate the opportunity. We are so happy to have you. Greg, Is the uh, he's done many things. It's going to be a fascinating hour or more. We'll get into some of the bigger cases he's, uh, he's, he's worked over the years. And, of course, his book is The Unknown Darkness, uh, Profiling the Predators Among Us. And if you like this profiling and true crime kind of stuff, I, I assure you, you will enjoy that book. And we'll catch up more about the book and some things read. Uh, Greg is doing. But I want to say up front um, that, Greg, you were probably the first profiler I ever worked with or met. Um, and we, we came across each other in two separate ways. Um, if you remember, I had a case out of New York of a woman who thought her father was a serial killer. And I'm not sure you ever officially opened the case in Quantico or we just kind of talked on the phone, but you were very helpful. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss that case at some point. It had to do with repressed memory at the end. But we right. put this woman undercover going up with her own father, who she hadn't seen in years. <clears throat> and uh, it went over about a year and a half uh, with New York State Police involved. And, Greg, uh, you basically called it right from the beginning. But we also realized we still had to follow through on some of these leads because this guy may have been a serial killer. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, uh, I'll never forget going to the New York City Homicide School, and I was there for two weeks. And um, I was one of only two FBI agents in the school. It's a very well-regarded school. People come in from around the country, even around the world, to get this two-week training by NYPD. <clears throat> and about the, I don't know, the third or fourth day in, one of the instructors was a guy named Vernon Gilbreth. Yeah, who's yeah. kind of well known in this in the homicide world. He was a NYPD, you know, captain, homicide, whatever. And, um, you know, he wrote a book or two and his reputation's pretty good. But uh, he came in the uh, in the training that day. I'm the only the other agent was out doing something else that day. So I'm the only FBI agent among about 100 people in this room in the old NYPD Academy. And Vernon Gelbreth goes off about the FBI left and right negative. They're a bunch of assholes. They're a bunch of shitbirds. They're this. They're, and I'm sitting there, and these detectives know who I am. And they're, like, looking at me, and they're more uncomfortable than I am. And we've all been there where people are kind of, oh, the FBI, this. Yeah, you laugh it off. You know, I was a cop. I would say stuff, too. But this guy went on for about 10 or 12 different heavy insults towards the FBI, some really bad language. And finally, at the end, I uh, I walked up to him. Everyone else was gone. I said, uh do you teach much, Mr. Gelbreth? What do you mean do I teach? I've done this 10 years now, you know. So, well, you should really get to know your audience because I'm an FBI agent and you kind of railed against me. My, well, hold on. You, uh, you, uh, you, what do you do? I said, I'm a street agent here in New York. Oh, I have no problem with you. It's those assholes in Quantico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. Well, first of all, that sounds like your own issue. And second of all, take it up with them. And third of all, why make me you know, the brothers. I said, I do some teaching too, Vernon, and I would never do this to my audience. So, Greg, you came in just by chance, like the next day, yeah. and I went up to you and, you know, again, in private, just the two of us, mm -hmm. FBI, FBI. And I said, do you know this guy? Do you know how he's uh, bad mouthing the Bureau? Yeah. And you had to do with a book he wrote and he got statistics from like two years before instead of one year and he was all pissed off because the book had already gone to the publisher. And I don't know, between the case we worked together in New York and then this NYPD thing, about a year later, an opening came in the unit for profile, or a bunch of uh, openings, about 18 at once, I think. And I put in for it. And uh, Greg, I think you saw my name come across. And mm -hmm. um, at least you didn't say anything bad about me, I don't think. True. And uh, so if anyone wants to curse me or, or don't like the fact that I became a profiler, um, Greg may may have had something to do with it back then. So, again, publicly, thank you for all your shepherding of cases and just listening to me uh, over over those couple of years. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that I did the NYPD homicide school a number of years, 
up there with Ray Pierce, who yeah, organized. pretty guy. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Ray was one of the first NYPD, uh, the, one of the first uh, police fellows that we trained. And uh, Ray was ultimately a big promoter of what uh, you know what we do. The quick backstory on Ray, he 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 said. Oh, the school at Quantico, he says, it's going to be a vacation. He said, uh, it's supposed to be like 10 months or a year, but he said, I'm going to go down for two weeks. What are they going to tell me about homicides that I don't know? I'm a lieutenant with a homicide. What, what are they going to tell me? Uh, he said, uh, two weeks into it, he goes, you know, I think these guys are on to something. I'm going to hang around. And, <laughs> uh, and he became one of our biggest proponents. But I also knew uh, what you experienced was that... Uh, um, uh, Geberth was uh, bad mouthing uh, Quantico and what we we're doing. And Ray said, "Would you mind coming in and just presenting what what you do uh, down there to counterbalance uh, the bullshit that uh, Vern is uh, putting out there?" And I said, "Yeah, no problem." I said, uh, uh, "Yeah, let Vern come on first. Let him do the thing. Then I'll come on, and everybody can make up their mind whether we got something going or uh, who's right and who's wrong." So. Uh, um, that's that's kind of the way that that worked out. Yeah, and you thanks for mentioning Ray Pierce because after Vernon left that day, Ray I think it was after lunch or something he came up. Hey, everyone in this class, I want you to know the press, the opinions and impressions by that last speaker has nothing to do with me, the NYPD. I work great with the uh, FBI, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and my last story is about five years later. We were like every once a, a, a month on a Wednesday, we'd bring in a guest speaker and usually outside to the FBI, some retired folks, whatever, to, to Quantico. And, and Vernon Gelberth was next to be on the list. And I went up to the bosses then, Bill Hagmeyer and a few others. You don't want this guy here. He badmouths us left and right. I was in the room. He's yeah. embarrassing. He tried to embarrass us. And we actually had a little bit of an argument. Finally, they said, OK, forget it. And as far as I know, up to yeah. 2007, when I retired, he was never invited back at the FBI. And look, if he's listening or people know him, you know, he knows his homicide stuff. He's fine. But he really didn't handle his audiences very well. And if he had a problem with the Quantico people, he should have made it very specific to that. So a uh, lesson for all of us, know your audience when you're training. If you're going to pick on a certain agency or a certain person, you may want to know who's in the crowd there that night. You know, I want to throw something out, Jim. You know, Greg was the first person that kind of touched your fancy a little bit into the profiling stratosphere. Believe it or not, he was the guy that did it for me as well. When I was in Buffalo, Arthur Shellcross was uh -huh. in Rochester, New York. And Craig had been in Buffalo, and Chuck Wagner, who was the, what we call the NCABC coordinator, but he was the liaison then uh, with the with the unit down there. And I remember when Greg came up, I met him and I said, well, I didn't make that great of an impression. I guess maybe because I was with Chuck, but uh, <laughs> he didn't remember me, you know, so we're just sitting here. But that was my first taste of it. And I said, this is something I want to do. And uh, that was 19, was it 1990, 1989. Right. Yeah, and exactly. Just yeah. Took off from there. Yeah. So thank you for that, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, so much. No, my pleasure. Well, Go ahead, Ray. Well, you know, Greg, before we get started, I know we we're kind of reminiscing a little bit, which is nice, but I'm sure our audience wants to know a little bit about you. What's your backstory uh, before you went into the FBI uh, and then eventually making your way down as mm -hmm. the first generation of the BSU or it's whatever it was at that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, EOD'd in the Bureau in 1969, under the old days under Hoover. Prior to that, I'd been out of college a couple of years. I was teaching. I know I didn't want to do that forever. Uh, I met an agent. He began to recruit me. I said uh, to myself, I said, I'm not sure what the FBI would want with me, but it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me uh, fill out the application and um, we'll see what happens. So I did. I went through, you know, how that goes, the, you know, the testing and the background and interviews and all of that. And lo and behold, I got... Uh, uh, got an appointment as an agent. And it was then, which I think it still is now, a three-year commitment. Um, and I said, well, hell, I can do anything for three years. If I don't like it, I'll, I'll quit after three years and, and do something else. And turned out I uh, quit after over 25 years. So it uh, turned into uh, to a, its own 
its own career. And briefly, um, my first office was Detroit, and I worked what I called disorganized crime there, bank robberies, kidnappings, extortions. Then uh, second office was New York, uh, and I worked organized crime there, the old LCM, La Cosa Nostra Mafia stuff primarily. And then I got transferred up to uh, Buffalo, uh, where I worked mostly organized crime stuff, but it's a smaller office, so you get a cross-section of uh, you know other things as well. And at that point, I became kind of the field coordinator for the NCABC, got to know John Douglas and Bressler, and in a, a slot opened up, and, uh, they, uh, and I was interested, and they encouraged me to, uh, to put in for it, and, uh, and it worked. And I went down and finished out um, uh, my career down at Quantico uh, uh, doing the profiling. Can I back you up a little bit, because there's not too many people we get on who can actually say they shook the hand of J. Edgar Hoover. I assume you went through that ritual. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, yes. Yeah, basically, yeah. We were warned to be very careful because he was aging and a little idiosyncratic at that time. And, and, uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and be careful. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to do. He said, because if he doesn't think you look or act like an agent, he said, we're going to have to find some, dream up some reason to fire you. So don't do anything screwy. Go in, you know, do it and uh, and get out of there. And they, and don't hang around the seventh floor because at that time we were training on the seventh floor headquarters. Um, uh, it, it was a crazy time back in um, in '69 in, in that regard. Um, the, the old the new academy, there the academy that is there now wasn't there. We were on kind of like a barracks um, on the main side of the base. We had eight guys to a room. Uh, two guys to a locker. Uh, it was a totally different uh, environment than, uh, you know, than we have now. And some of the training took place there, some at headquarters, some at the old Washington Fieldhouse, which was the old post office, which was the Trump Hotel and now is the Waldorf or whatever, whatever it is now. Uh, but that was the old post office. And that's where Washington Field Office was back in the day. So we did some training and then uh, some actually... Uh, work with the Washington field office uh, to get our feet wet, uh, just working under the wings of agents there before we actually went out to our first office. But but there are stories of people that Hoover didn't like their handshake, their grip, whatever, and he would note to Clyde Tolson or whoever next to him, yeah. this guy goes and the, yeah. the guy'd be fired. And I mean, just, yeah. he wouldn't even know why necessarily. So you made it through that test. <laughs> yes, I did, I did. So. So yeah, then it was off to Detroit, and uh, as opposed to the uh, nice graduation ceremonies they have at Quantico now, it was uh, use your orders and don't let the sun set on your ass in mm -hmm. DC. You know, get uh, get out there. So uh, that's uh, that's the way that was. Uh, you know, back in the day. Early on, um, you're down in a unit. You know, for our audience, I mean, you know, every, Fitz and I know what it's like now what it has been, what it what it's kind of changed to. But you were you were there in the very, very beginning. What was it like? Yeah, it was it was um uh it was a unique experience. We were down in the basement, sixty feet underground. They had us in the old bomb shelter uh down there. And so I say death finds its way to the basement, right? And mor morgues are never in a penthouse and the same way they, they put us down there because we're doing doing weird stuff and uh you know, nobody really wanted to know too much about it, at, you know, at that point. And, and it was definitely not well accepted. I mean, this idea of psychology and the soft science, I mean, you know, the Bureau of Macho Hard Science, um, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. And this is the squishy soft science. And, you know, we, you know, get some pushback and uh, questions about the validity of, you know, what we we're doing. Was it going to be applicable at all to anything that, that, you know, that we were doing. And, you know, the idea of oh, what you, you're out interviewing serial killers, what, what they're, so what they become a serial killer because they don't have the benefit of a hot lunch program. I mean, who cares? <laughs> what, what do we care about that stuff? And eventually we get to, to across to them the idea that, Hey, these are the experts, not us. If we want to understand how they do what they do, let's go interview them. They're the, they're the ones actually doing this stuff, not us. 
let's let's go learn from them and see what we can you know what we can pick up and then that's uh, you know you know the it's the old adage about a new truth you know there there are three phases of that one is resistance and the second phase is just virulent resistance and then the third phase is being accepted as obvious all along and that's that's what I, oh yeah we should have been doing these interviews all along that makes perfect sense of course they're the experts of course we should be doing this and uh, so it was a, a transitional period in there to uh, um, you know to get to get us a little more accepted and of course the same with the PDs I mean oh the psychobabble crap you're going to come out and tell us but uh, but you know I always said if you give me an experienced detective who's looked at cases he's going to see the value of what we're doing and they're going to see the applicability and I think that's what people get misunderstand about profiling in other words if you're a detective and I come to you and you know you come to me about a case I say well it's you know, it's a white guy in his 30s and this kind of a background or, or whatever. I mean, the right response, I think, from the detective is, well, it's kind of interesting, but but how do I catch the guy? And that's exactly it. That's that's what this is designed to do. The most important things we do, as you guys know, is investigative strategy or interview strategy um, to move the investigation along uh, and not just, you know, opine about, you know, the guy's criminal history necessarily. So it's and then laying those traps of behavior, using his own behavior to to entrap him or catch him in some way is, is really how it works. So um, eventually people, once they see it work, uh, they become believers in, in, in what we're doing. You know, it's such a ring of truth to that. Um, I'm in Philly. I transfer in late 91 and early 92. Uh, Fitz, I don't think you were down with this, but they had a NCAVC school. A one week. Basically. Again, National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. I mean, I'll explain that. But when you when you look at that, that NCAVC, and I don't even know if it was N, uh, N, uh, NCAVC then. I don't think it was called that. I think it was just uh, behavioral analysis or something like that. I don't think it got into that. I don't think that came into a little bit later, Jim. But I remember sitting on the bank robbery squad, which was violent crime, and I remember them saying, uh, I get called in by the supervisor because I was a young guy and uh, on, on, on the squad in year wise, maybe four or five years in. And uh, I remember them saying, hey, we got to send someone down to Quantico to this hocus pocus bullshit. And I said, uh, I'm thinking, uh, shit, uh, well, look, I'll volunteer. I'll go, you know, because that's what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to do that. But they didn't know that But because nobody else wanted to go. They all thought it was a crock, crock of crap. So it wasn't just the cops. No, yeah. It oh, was, yeah. It was our own people. Totally. Yeah, trying to sell it in-house was one of the tougher sells, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It was our own people. They, they just thought it was a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. These guys, I don't know what the hell they think they're talking about, but they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I did. I got it. You know, I drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah. So... so Greg, when I got to the unit in 95, you had just retired. We never technically worked together in the unit. Correct. Um, and we went through a, there was about 18 of us. Uh, I guess 12 went to the child abduction serial killer unit. It was brand new, started just about the time you left. And I went to the investigative support unit. They all wound up merging to the behavioral analysis unit. Then there are different numbers assigned to them. But they basically put us through a 12-week training block. So, of course, we went through the academy for 16 weeks when we first came in as as brand new special agents. Mm -hmm. And then here I am back at uh, the academy um, um, taking, you know, these courses taught by John Douglas and others from the outside and and inside, whatever. And um, but I'm wondering when you first got to the unit, um, was it mid early 80s for you? I'm not even sure the exact time. For, yeah, what kind of training was involved? Yeah, um, it was. It was basically just working uh, under the wing of these guys with John right. and Bob Douglas, uh, you know, uh, Bob uh, Ressler and John Douglas and uh, Ken Lanning and uh, Roy Hazelwood and all those guys. And it was just basically working under their wing and going out with them on on cases and just just kind of getting your just getting thrown in the deep end of the pool and traveling along and picking it up as as we went along. There were some formal schools. Um, I went to the. Uh, um, a, a couple of classes, actually more than that, that was 
Uh, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Bethesda, had, uh, Maryland, had courses in basic and advanced forensic pathology uh, and went to some interview schools outside the Bureau, uh, Reed and, you know, and some other ones. So there's some outside schools that, you know, that I went to, but a lot of it was just the in-house, uh, the in-house training itself and, and just being there and, and getting immersed in that stuff. So it wasn't as formal a training as you had. Yeah, and we had some of that too. What you're describing, also, but uh, yeah. but the, the formal training, and of course, I provided that training later in my career to new yeah. agents as uh, or new profilers, I should say, yeah. <clears throat> as they came in. So, do you remember uh, what would you say was your earliest, you know, biggest case as a profiler? Uh, was it something you worked on your own with your colleagues? I mean, it's always a collegial effort yeah. there, but sometimes yeah. you you still have the ticket on it. And do you yeah. remember what that case would have been? Yes. Yeah, I do. It was um, a serial rape case up in Toronto um, and uh, worked with the Metro Toronto PD on that in their sex uh, assault squad up there. We had a serial rapist working in Scarborough, which is a Tony kind of suburb northeast of Toronto itself. And these women were being raped. These were outdoor rapes at night. They were getting off the bus, most of them, um, commuting in from downtown Toronto back out to the suburbs. And as they were walking from the bus stop home, uh, a lone male would accost them, drag them off into the uh, between houses or in a parking lot or uh, someplace and, and rape them. And of concern was the escalating amount of violence uh, that was there. Uh, and as you know, we do that sort of triad of behavioral analysis, verbal, sexual, physical behavior, analyzing all three. Uh, the verbal behavior was profusely uh, profane, uh, very degrading uh, and so forth. The physical violence, the amount of force used was escalating over the, the course of the rapes until the last, uh, well, we had seven at the time I went up there. He'd beaten her to, to the point she had a broken collarbone and bruised ribs and, and uh, you know, he'd ground her face into the dirt and, uh, you know, all, all of that sort of thing. Um, and, and sexually very, very violent with the, uh, you know, the women as well. So uh, that was the first real case that I got involved in that, that um, I, I, you know, that I had the lead on, uh, you know, in, in, in that situation. Now, uh, to cut to the chase, it was a very interesting case in a, in a number of ways because uh, our concern was that this playing up toward homicide. Sure. But then um, they just stopped. Hey, Cold Red fans, Fitz here. Are you interested in a career in criminal justice? You've heard me talk about numerous cases I've worked over the years involving the scientific analysis of language known as forensic linguistics. Well, Pennsylvania Western University now has a fully accredited MA program, which I actually co-develop, where I teach forensic linguistics along with various other excellent professors too. This is the only forensic linguistic graduate program in the world, which is both online and asynchronous. That means the courses are 100% on your schedule. We have professor video recordings, academic readings, and real life case exercises posted weekly, and you can access any time to review and then complete the week's assignment. If you're interested in learning how written and spoken language can help solve crimes and get a master's degree at the same time, check out the Pennsylvania Western University's Forensic Linguistics Program at www.penwest.edu slash justice. Uh, I mean, there are a few more and they were violent, but they just they just stopped. And so now two years go by and you know how that, that is. Uh, meanwhile, I've been working some other cases in that two year period uh, with some Canadian authorities up there, Niagara Regional Police and uh, Ontario Provincial Police. And they had some murders and things I'd worked. And then um, a couple of years later, they, they brought me a, a, another case which was uh, the murder, the rape and murder of a young girl. And um, she'd been out late um, and got locked out of the house and it looked like an opportunistic thing. She just disappeared. And then two weeks later, her dismembered body is found in a reservoir and the body is in cement blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they called me in, they wanted me involved in that case. 
And uh, so I got involved. Uh, we began working that one. A few months later, um, there was an abduction of a 16-year-old girl from another part of Southern Ontario. Uh, but there was some reason I began to get concerned about the linkage, as, as did they. Uh, the first girl was um, abducted in uh, Burlington, and her body was dumped in St. Catharines. The second girl was abducted in St. Catharines, and her body was dumped in Burlington. But the body dumped in Burlington was within 500 yards of the grave of the first victim. Interesting. So, yeah. So is this a coincidence or, you know, is this, uh, you know, what do we have going on? So um, they started a uh, task force to, uh, to do these investigations. And we had some other extraneous murders. And you know how that goes. You had to figure out which ones were and weren't involved. And one was an accident and one was another one. But these Greg, can, I, can I interrupt you for one second? Uh, sure. Our younger viewers and listeners, this is probably the time before DNA analysis was in place. where You could definitely link the, 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 the crimes to one person. So, so. That's an excellent point because DNA was just coming on the scene. Uh, and this was, I was up initially in 1989, I think, uh, in Toronto. So it was just base barely coming on, but they were taking DNA samples from hmm. suspects um, at that time. But it was, you know, you needed, uh, it, well, first of all, to get the sample from the victim, you needed a lot, uh, which, you know, we don't need today. And then uh, go out and taking the DNA samples. And then the testing and the analysis was a much more laborious process than it was now. Um, but they did take, uh, I think, over 100 different DNA samples from potential suspects. Just, a, you know, um, they just asked people for their DNA. They had some reason to, you know, to look at them. So, um, so now we're in uh, 1992 now, by the time we get this abduction of uh, uh, Kristen French. And uh, there are a couple of interesting sidelights. One um, was the, there was a TV producer up there who came forward and said he wanted to help. I got a call from the um, Vince Bevan who was running the task force. He said, you ever had TV people that want to help? And I said, well, I'm a, you know, law enforcement is a little skeptical of TV. And uh, and I said, well, yeah, I said, let's let's think about this. There might be a way. And uh, so we decided, yeah, we would do it. And and uh, uh, then what started out as a 30 minute program turned into a 90 minute. And I said, we can use this maybe investigatively. Uh, I said, because the killer is going to be watching this. I said, you know, put the advertisement out. Everybody's going to want to, he's going to want to know what's going on. Uh, so, um, so we did. Now in the abduction, eyewitnesses described two males in a cream colored Camaro abducting this 16 year old girl from the parking lot of a church. So, um, so we got two offenders uh, at the scene. So what we did in the um, TV show uh, was one, we hit all the emotional buttons. Uh, you know, she was a Christian French, great, nice kid, 16 year old, you know, everybody's sweetheart kind of thing. And we hit those kind of emotional buttons. And then we'd separate that with objective uh, police kind of stuff about the investigation, but obviously not telling <laughs> what we were actually doing with the case, but uh, giving some information about it. And then I came on and what my point was, was to kind of quote unquote profile. Uh, but I used fear as kind of a weapon. I, I said, this guy's a cold psychopathic killer, but uh, I described the second offender is uh, in a much more favorable uh, way saying, didn't really probably want to go along with this, didn't like it, probably isn't that bad a person, but they're in danger because as this case closes in and we're closing in, uh, this person could be at risk and could be, you know, being killed. And so I'm trying to drive a wedge in there if I can um, between the two offenders and uh, uh, and then other people. I said, you know, if you think you know this guy, you need to call in because he's dangerous and he could kill people around him. I, I gave an example like of Ed Kemper killing his mother and, you know, that sort of thing. So I said, you know, everybody needs to, everybody's in best interest to call this in. And so the profile also, I said, this guy is typically 
you know, he hates women. Uh, you know, we linked those two cases, the girl in the cement blocks and Kristen French together. We didn't say that in the uh, TV show exactly, but um, but we, we indicated, you know, there were some similarities in the cases. And I said, this guy is brutal to all the women in his life, and he, he's going to be abusive. He's in a relationship with a wife or a girlfriend. That's going to be an abusive relationship and so forth. So lo and behold, um, what happens is this girl gets beaten badly by her boyfriend, and she's in the hospital. She files a complaint. Uh, his name is Paul Bernardo. Her name is Carla Homoka. Paul gets arrested for the uh, domestic uh, homicide, for the domestic violence. Uh, now, he was also a guy that gave his DNA to the Scarborough rapes two years ago. He was living in Scarborough. Now he's living up in St. Catharines uh, area. Uh, and at the same time, two years later, took two years for the DNA testing to be done on Bernardo. And it's a hit. He's the wow. Scarborough rapist. So this whole thing explodes. Um, and uh, so now he's our prime suspect in the murders. He's our prime suspect uh, in the uh, rapes. Uh, so this guy, I really profiled twice without knowing, uh, but he did exactly what we thought he was going to do tragically, which is escalate up to, uh, uh, you know, up the murders. Uh, one thing from the profiling thing that, that, that worked really well uh, was that I worked with the Crown attorneys to get a search warrant. He's a sexually sad sadistic guy. I, I said he would have videotaped this, and there's going to be videotapes of these uh, crimes. And so we got a search warrant uh, to search his residence. Um, now, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is the cops searched it, and they didn't find it, uh, didn't find the videotapes. Uh, he wrote a letter to his attorney who then went in after the cops had searched. He took the videotapes. Um, that came into our, uh, to our attention eventually. Uh, once he realized we knew that the authorities knew we had the tapes and they're threatening to charge him with witness, uh, with evidence tampering and, and so forth, he, he gave them up. And um, there they were. There are the tapes of him doing the, the, the rapes and the murders. And so forth. Then the one final bizarre twist, uh, I'll tell you, Carla, uh, came, she, she rolled over and, and gave a lot of this up. And she gave up another murder that we didn't even know. Uh, and that was her sister, that they had raped and murdered her younger sister, uh, Tammy, uh, at a Christmas family Christmas uh, party. Paul had always wanted to have sex with her. Carla said, no, I'm not, you know, it's not going to happen. You're not going to have sex with my little sister. He finally put enough pressure on Carla that Carla uh, brought drugs and drugged um, her younger sister. She passed out and then they raped her. And that's on the videotapes. And then she died of a drug overdose. So it wasn't seen as a homicide, uh, much less a sexual homicide. It was ruled an accidental death by drugs and alcohol. Uh, and only later did we learn the the, the truth about that. So that's uh, that's certainly one of the more memorable cases, uh, you know, I had. And it started off not long after I got down in the uh, the unit. That's uh, that's an amazing story, and I know I've heard you tell bits and pieces. I know it's in your book too. Yeah. Um, I forget what Paul's status is, but I think only in the last few years, um, Carla. Uh, was going to get out of prison. There was a lot of controversy whether she should be eligible for parole or not. Do you know anything about that part? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She was. She cut a deal with the prosecutors, and all I can say is their legal system must be different than ours. They cut a deal for twelve years, and of course, you know, here you cut a deal. It's if you tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and if you don't tell the truth, the deal's off. Well, she had not mentioned the murder of her sister until the videotapes uh, came out. Uh, but yet they were locked into this 12 years. So she did her 12 years and she's out. Uh, and there was even controversy with that because it, 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 there, during the time she was serving her 12 years, photos of her came out at Christmas parties and different things. And, and she's in a minimum security prison. And, and it, you know, it's very controversial. It still is in Canada. It still is a, 
a very hot topic up there for people who, who know the case, and know what's, uh, what's going on with her. And remind me, what's Bernardo's status? Is he still uh, with us? He's forever. He, yeah, he's, he's locked up uh, for the duration. <laughs> he'll, never, he'll never get out. Um, I mean, he's technically eligible for consideration, but no way in the world uh, <laughs> are they going to let this guy out, uh, and rightfully so. Agreed. That was an excellent learning case for me, and you may have presented it to us at some point, but it's pretty rare to have serial offenders work in tandem. Um, and certainly two men. And it sounds like early on, even with the suspect lead, they didn't know the uh, co-conspirator was a woman necessarily. We did not. No, we were going with the witnesses <laughs> who described two males. That's the most uh, statistically probable scenario. But your strategy was excellent to kind of scare. There's always an alpha male involved in when it is more than one person. And right. you get beta in down the line after that, especially right. if it's a woman. And through right. your profile, you kind of put the fear of God in her. Yeah. And who knows if that actually well, was the uh, eliciting factor of the domestic I abuse. I think it was because I, I, I kind of skipped over everything. I didn't, you know, we could talk about this for a long time. But <laughs> once, um, once we knew we had the pro we had the dna and we knew that carla you know uh, was the wife and so forth we designed the interview strategy for the police to go up and talk to her and they went up and uh, she thought initially uh well first of all she was surprised it was like four or five detectives and not just the niagara regional pd about the domestic violence but it was these task force guys and they talked to her about the domestic thing, but then they began asking her, do you know anything about Scarborough, any rapes in Scarborough? Do you know anything about an abduction from the Grace, Grace Lutheran Church in St. Catharines of a 16-year-old girl uh, and so forth? We know now that when they, they didn't push it, they just laid it out there. When they left, she, she was with, uh, with her parents uh, I, or it was an aunt and uncle, I think. Anyway, she turned to them and she said, oh my God, they know everything. Uh, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. She got an attorney, which is exactly what we were hoping because now the attorney uh, came forward and said, I've got a witness that can be helpful in solving this. Let's make a deal. And sure. so that's how, it, that's how it played out. I have a question for you, Greg. Yeah. I, I know a lot of our listeners because we get some of these questions that come in to Jim, to Jim and I from time to time. When you're looking at these cases, uh, when do you know that you're on to something? How do you see these things? Is, is it your experience or what is it that, that leads you down that path where you feel like, hey, I'm on to something here? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um... I, I don't quite know how to explain it. I certainly is experience. I think when you begin to look at enough of these cases, certain things begin to resonate, but it's also evidence driven. Um, uh, and, you know, there are coincidences, but then again, um, you know, when things start coming together, I mean, the body being within 500 yards of the gravestone of the other girl and things like that, you, it, that definitely get your attention about, uh, you know, linking the, uh, beginning to link the uh, cases um, together. So each case is unique in its own way, I think. And, uh, um, and you know, you just get a, se a sense. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's difficult for me to articulate, but I think it's based on the evidence and the totality of the circumstances that you're dealing with that you get a sense of who you're after or if you're on the right, um, you know, headed down the right path uh, that's going to get you where you need to go. But it, could it be too that um, some of these guys are creatures of habit, and they don't totally. They don't it's break. it's the pattern. Yeah, yeah. It's the pattern uh, that they are involved in. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned the Shawcross case in Rochester very briefly. How he got caught? I mean, was the investigative strategy that we gave uh, to the cops, um, and they they instituted this uh, strategy. Uh, in other words, he'd been killing prostitutes. Um, we had three missing women that we thought were victims, but we had no bodies yet. 
And so we, you know, we'll always, as you know, want to be proactive with these things. So, so let's not wait for another citizen to find it. Let's go. Let's us go. Let's law enforcement get out there and look for these bodies because we thought he was coming back to mutilate these victims. The latest victim we'd had was a girl named June Stott who had been eviscerated. We thought, yeah, she's part of the the uh, the series, and he's going to come back and eviscerate more. So we're going to go find bodies. So, okay, so where do you go look? Well, you use his behavior. You look at his pattern to develop your investigative strategy. He dumped all these bodies along. We call him the Genesee River Gorge guy. He jumped, dumped these bodies along the River Gorge and in tributaries. First body was in Salmon Creek, which was a tributary to, to the Genesee River. So we got the New York State Police. Uh, Genesee County Sheriff's Office, Rochester PD, put up helicopters, put guys on the ground, and we're searching in in, in and along the gorge in the waterways. And lo and behold, uh, they fly over Salmon Creek, again, the, where one of the, the first victim's body was found. Boom, there's a body underneath a bridge. And he, here's, <laughs> you make your own luck in these cases. Parked on that bridge over the body was a guy uh, and it was colder than hell in January, and he was out of the car um, uh, on this bridge. Of course, he saw the blue and gold New York State Police blazoned helicopter, got back in and, and took off. They did the right thing, get the ground units, follow him in, get him identified. And who is this guy? Well, it's Shawcross, uh, and he's, he's our guy. Do the background. We did a quick criminal history. He did 15 years for sexual homicide. We're going... Holy shit, <laughs> you know, here we are. This is our guy. And um, sure enough, uh, you know, that's that's who it was. But that's the pattern we're talking about, the pattern of behavior of dumping those bodies there and then go searching uh, in in that same area. And lo and behold, he had murdered the uh, and uh, not only murdered, but had engaged in postmortem mutilation with that victim who was under the bridge. So it all, you know, it all came together and it all, it, you know, it all played out. That was a great case. That was a great, that was my, uh, that was my first, that was my swan song yeah. there. I mean, uh, yeah. that really, that's what got me involved. Yeah. And again, it's that idea of providing investigative strategy, looking for the patterns, then using his own behavior against himself. Um, you know, that's, that's the way if we can do it, that's, that, that can work. Greg, backing up a little bit, at some point uh, you became involved in authoring what is still a very um, well-known research document. That's the Crime Classification Manual. You were involved in that, weren't you? Explain oh, yeah. a little bit to our audience right. how that came about and what its purpose was. Right. Uh, the idea was uh, we wanted to <clears throat> create a crime, a crime classification manual that would mirror uh, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental of Mental Disorders, which is what psychologists and psychiatrists use to classify, diagnose uh, mental disorders. Well, we decided we would like to do the same thing for crime. Uh, let's have a kind of a diagnostic manual, and um, and then talk about uh, the defining characteristics, just like the DSM does. What are the characteristics and traits of a particular disorder? And then we'd put in some investigative considerations if you have this kind of a, a case so that that could be helpful to to, uh, to the investigators. So, and, and you know, the, we're at what, DSM-5 now, I think, or wh whatever it is, I've lost track. But uh, we felt, well, this is going to be like DSM-1. You know, this is going to be the entry level uh, that can be refined over time, um, you, know, as, as, you know, as time goes on and, and but let's get a foundational uh, work in, and then we can, you know, we, we could work on it and develop it from there. So that was that was the idea behind the uh, crime classification manual. Yeah, it was a Bible for us young profilers. And Ray, I'm sure you have a copy somewhere too. I do. I have one here. I could pull it out. I, matter of fact, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I it, it made it mandatory for I teach a violent crime class where we talk about some cases mm. and things of that nature, and that's one of the required reading <clears> books. So that they can look into that and kind of get an understanding. It was a great cool. resource. Great. Oh, good. Resource. Good. Greg, I uh, over the years, the OPP in Canada and the RCMP, mm -hmm. they built a very strong profiling uh, 
unit, separate ones, but they kind of work together too. And it sounds like you may have been there in the early days. They brought you up and I'm sure uh, you probably <clears throat> indirectly sort of helped formulate some policy for there's those own their own different agencies to start their own profiling units, so to speak. And I know OPP, RCMP, and others have some very strong units and some good people over the years that came out of there. Yes, yeah, Kate. Uh, there's a female, uh, Kate Lyons, who was uh, went through our police fellowship. She's from OPP. She was very good and went back. Greg, and- Greg, let me back you up. You mentioned that with Ray. What is what was the police fellowship and how did it work? Yeah, that was um, a program about 10 months. We bought in um, police uh, detectives from their departments with the idea that their department would pay their salary, but we would house them and feed them and train them at, at Quantico. So we did. Uh, we housed them <laughs> at Quantico. Uh, you know, we fed them and we trained them. And the idea would be that they would go back to their department as resources, not only for their department, but for all the regional police departments around the area. And then we would work in liaison with them. And a, a good example, I just mentioned the Shawcross case. I had Eddie Grant, who was a lieutenant with the New York State Police, who we trained. Eddie worked with me on the Shawcross case um, as well. So this is the idea behind the police uh, uh, fellowship uh, program. And it was international. We trained folks uh, from the Netherlands, from Australia, uh, and so forth. So it wasn't limited solely to uh, to the U.S., but we're looking for people from major departments that could go back and be a resource for their department, uh, as well as surrounding uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, neighbor, neighboring agencies as well. I kind of interrupted you here, but you mentioned Kate Lyons. I know she was one of the early profilers, yep. and I think the OPP, right? Yeah, she did the OPP. She went up and, and really instituted, uh, set the framework in place for a robust uh, behavioral science unit. And they, they kind of modeled it after our model. In other words, they, they brought in outside experts, as we do, uh, forensic pathologists, forensic psychiatrists. Um, Dr. Collins up in uh, Ontario is a uh, forensic psychiatrist that works with OPP. Um, so they they had a had a very strong uh, program uh, up there. Matter of fact, I did work with Kate some on the Bernardo case uh, as well. She was involved um, uh, uh, working with me in that case as well. And if we didn't say it, OPP is Ontario Provincial Police and uh, yeah. one of many of the province uh, police agencies there. Uh, again, we can go on for hours with this. Uh, I'm just in kind of order, I think you were still in the bureau when you worked, uh, and I, but I know you're doing some current work. The Jack Unterneger case. Yeah, Unterneger. Yeah, Jack Unterneger. Yeah. Totally. Walk us through that matter. Uh, an international serial killer. Yeah, it was <clears throat> another uh, one of the more memorable cases that I worked, and it, it, it's 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 an example of how this behavioral analysis can be used in different ways. Um, he was. Um, I got a call from our legal, our legal attache. We have agents uh, assigned to every embassy overseas. I got a call from our legal attache, our legat in Vienna, and that the uh, Austrian authorities had a serial murder case. They thought they had a good suspect, um, <clears throat> but they'd never worked one before, and they would like to tap into the Bureau's expertise on this uh, to see if there's anything we could do to be helpful. And of course, we say what we say, which is yes, you know, we'd be happy to try and help out. So um, I said, either I can come over or they can come over here. They sent two guys over here, the lead investigator and an associate over here. Um, and what I told them, they had made an arrest, but I told them I didn't want to know anything about the suspect. I wanted to look at this as a profiling case. I just want to look at the crimes and see if they're related and, and draw up my own profile. Then let's layer, lay that, overlay that on the suspect and let's see where, where, where we go from here and what we can do. Um, again, it's a long story. I just kind of keep it short, but um, uh, I did the analysis. They were here for a couple of weeks uh, and I did nothing but clear the deck and work with them for a couple of weeks on the case. Um, <clears throat> And the profile I constructed really matched this guy uh, very well. And of course, the big problem was with an international case, he's murdering in uh, Austria, in uh, Czechoslovakia, 
uh, in Los Angeles. So how do you connect these cases? And, uh, you know, one is that can we put them in every one of these places where the crimes occurred? And the answer is yes. Uh, so right away, he's either the unluckiest guy in the world or, uh, or there's something going on. We, again, we talked about coincidences and so forth. Plus, he was a convicted murderer already, uh, had done a, a, a sexual homicide, had done 15 years in prison, and then was uh, released. It, it's an interesting side story. He went, um, and there, there's a learning thing here too, I think. He got convicted of murdering this 18-year-old girl. They didn't charge him with another murder, but uh, he went into prison illiterate. He learned to read and write. He became an award-winning playwright and author. He became the darling of the Viennese Cafe Literal, uh, Literary <laughs> Society. Uh, they thought it was proof of the redemptive power of the arts that he channeled his homicidal tendencies into the artistic realm and he was uh, rehabilitated and they petitioned for his release and he was released. And then he went to all the book signings and the play openings and, and you know, was on TV and talking about prison reform and excuse me, all these sorts of things. At the same time, he's out murdering 11 women uh, while he was uh, doing this. Uh, so, I mean, to me, the learning point there is, uh, you know, I asked kind of the rhetorical question uh, in the chapter I wrote on this. I said, so what do you get when you educate a psychopath? You get an educated psychopath. That's what you get. He's not rehabilitated. Uh, That's right. He's not a good guy to, you know, to, to, to release. Um, so um, I worked with the uh, uh, L.A. cops and worked with the Austrian authorities. And what I did is a signature crime analysis with this, linking the crimes together behaviorally and on, on some of the forensic evidence. The biggest thing forensically, and there was good work done by a criminalist uh, out in L.A., in the L.A. County Sheriff's Office, um, who uh, looked at the knots. Uh, all these women were uh, tied. They did ligature strangulation. They died of ligature strangulation. Interestingly, the knots in every case were tied exactly the same way, in a complicated manner, but exactly the same way. The knots in the European cases and the LA cases. So this was a forensic linkage. Uh, and then we had some other things. We had the DNA of, of one of the victims, the Czechoslovakia victim, in his car. Uh, there was some other um, forensic evidence, some uh, hairs and fibers that linked them to some of the other crimes. So there was some physical and forensic uh, evidence. Uh, but then again, I kind of linked, used that along with behavior to link these cases together behaviorally. I ended up testifying against him in his trial in Graz, uh, Austria, um, and he was, um, you know, was was convicted um, there. Of it, interestingly, nine of the eleven, uh, I give the jury a lot of credit. Uh, they didn't convict. They they had to be very thoughtful because the two they didn't convict them of were skeletal remains where we couldn't prove that they died of ligature strangulation, even though there was a knot, a garment knotted there at the uh, uh, remains. But um, uh, they convicted them of nine of the uh, eleven uh, cases, uh, which one would have been fine. Nine was was great. And to me, it validated the signature crime because they convicted them of the L.A. cases, uh, the Czechos case, and, and uh, uh, the, the rest were the uh, Austrian cases. Uh, and a quick end to this story, um, within six hours of being convicted, uh, he hung himself in his jail cell. Uh, so uh, I was disappointed. I was looking forward to try to spend some time, talk to him a little bit, but, uh, you know, he... Uh, um, you know, that was um, his way out. I, you, know, I, you know, I've talked about this before. It's not guilt or remorse or shame or anything. The last thing he had control over was his life. He was not going to allow us the satisfaction of knowing he was rotting away in prison. He was going to take uh, control over the last thing he had control over. And this was his, you know, if I may be blunt, his last fuck you to society. You know, he's, he's not, he's out of there. He's, he's, He's gone, not going to give us the satisfaction, uh, not going to subjugate himself to the rule of law. 
That's what psychopaths do, right? I mean, it's uh, exactly. Exactly. one last in the way out. I wonder if the knot he tied around his neck matched the ones uh, it did. It was, crime it was his finest murder of all. It was the best murder of all, in my opinion. Um, it was uh, consistent. It yeah, was he was. There's the, the pattern. It's the pattern that we've pattern, we've, exactly. we've discussed. Greg, Greg, aren't you doing some uh, media work about this case? Is there anything you can talk about? Yeah, yeah. There's actually there'll be. Um, uh, there come a, a couple of programs, one on Netflix that's coming out probably in the fall um, uh, about this case. And there's another one that should be out uh, before that, but I haven't heard directly about that, that will be on Peacock uh, streaming service. So I can stay in touch and let you know once I know what's right. what's going on. But yeah, you know, true crime is is a big thing now. So uh, a lot of media flocking to these interesting cases. And uh, so, yeah, so I've done a couple of recent interviews on the, on the case. And it looks to me like both productions are going to be pretty good. So I'm looking forward to see see how they turn out. Well, if you're a part of it, no doubt it will be. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you about another case that I think you might have had something to do with, the Sam Shepard homicide case. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the old uh, Sam Shepard uh Case again. Um, I'm old. I'm not that old, but yet I got involved in this case. It was a 1954 homicide initially of his wife um, in uh, Bay Village, Ohio. Sam was a uh, um, a uh, surgeon. His he and his two brothers, all three were doctors. Uh, they opened a hospital in Bay Village and were running that. He was well respected uh, guy in the uh, community. Um, and on uh, a July 4th weekend, his wife was brutally bludgeoned to death uh, in, in their home in Bay Village, Ohio. Very unusual, uh, as you can imagine, 1950s, suburban Bay Village, Ohio, not a hot of crime. Um, and so it was a big deal. Bay Village, Ohio PD uh, called in um, uh, the Cleveland PD homicide to help them. Uh, uh, with a, a shout out to Bay Village, Ohio, the initial police report I read it was very good for for investigators who really didn't have much experience. They they did a, uh, I thought, a credible job um, initially. Uh, so to cut to the chase, how did I get involved in this thing? Sam was initially convicted. Uh, he spent 10 years in prison, tried a number of appeals that didn't work. He got a brand new attorney. Uh, he, he dumped his old attorneys, got a brand new guy, just fresh out of law school, a uh, kid named F. Lee Bailey. And uh, uh, and Bailey took a different approach. He's, he didn't try to argue the evidence, couldn't argue that. Uh, he said he didn't get a fair trial because of undue publicity. And that worked. So they gave him a second trial, and then he was acquitted in that trial. So fast forward now, his son uh, sued the state of Ohio for... Um, um, wrongful conviction, malicious prosecution, negligent police work, and so forth. So um, I got a call from the prosecutor's office in Cleveland about this civil case. And they, uh, and they, I give them all the credit in the world. They said, we want to know what happened here. We, you know, we want you to come over and take a look and tell us what you think. If the cops screwed it up, prosecution was bad, we'll own it. We'll, we'll try to make it right. But if they were right, if, if the investigation was good, the prosecution was fair, we need to defend their investigation and the integrity of the case. We just want to get to the bottom of this thing. I said, I'm in. I'm in. Greg, what, what year is this? I think you're retired at this point, right? Yes. Yeah. This is uh, 97 now. I've been retired a couple of years. So um, so it's an interesting case because it was a, kind of a cold case homicide. We did uh, exhumations of bodies. We did DNA evidence. We did all, you know, all of this sort of thing, um, as well as a deep dive into the original uh, investigation to try to try to figure out exactly what, you know, what it, what occurred. Um, so, having gone through all of this, and again, we could spend a lot of time talking about the case. But uh, my opinion, at the end of the day, was they got it right the first time that this was a staged domestic homicide that Sam had murdered his wife and tried to make it look like a stranger had come in. Um, now, the plaintiff that was suing, they thought they had the murder solved uh, with a handyman uh, that had uh, uh, worked for them 
And uh, they thought they had his DNA at the scene, uh, and uh, which would be very compelling evidence, um, uh, you know, if they did. Uh, but their DNA evidence, uh, their DNA analysis uh, was flawed. Uh, and um, we weren't sure how they were going to handle that. They kept touting this DNA evidence. But basically what happened with their DNA, and again, it's a, an idea how you get swept up and uh, the, their DNA expert is an expert, but he just got caught up in his frenzy that that Sam didn't do it and they had the guy who did. And he overlooked basic serology. And, and you know, DNA is a process of elimination, right? So, so the blood in question was a type O. And um, the, the uh, handyman's blood type was type A. It couldn't be. It couldn't be the same blood, period. End of story. Forget the DNA stuff. And they got into the DNA and they, well, a couple of alleles are close and, you know, all this nonsense. We didn't know how they were going to handle it. And um, and they got on the stand. He got on the stand and went through this about the alleles and all this. And then, uh, but didn't deal with the fundamental issue. And Steve Dever, the uh, prosecutor, got up and drove his tank through that open door, you know, and turned this guy from a, uh, a plaintiff expert to a defense expert in about 90 <laughs> seconds, you know, he said, well, the, you know, the, the, the blood on the door is type O. Yes, it is. And the handyman, his name was Richard Everling. Everling's blood is type A, is it not? And you can see the deer in the headlights look. He goes, <laughs> I don't know. You mean to tell me after this 250 hours you spent in the case, you never bothered to type Everling's DNA, uh, blood? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Well, if I told you that was type A, what does that say about being the source of that type O blood. Well, it couldn't be, uh, you know, boom, there, you know, that went out. But the, the, the reason I thought it was a staged domestic, I mean, there are a number of reasons. One, victimology, right? Let's look at Maryland. What was going on? Sam was having an affairs with all these different women. We had letters from back in the day, and that's the hard part about doing victimology on a case 50 years old. Uh, how do you get good good evidence? We had these letters that were a gold mine, yeah. where she was uh, writing uh, these letters to Sam's brother and said, "I'm going to divorce him and I'm going to ruin him and and you know he's sleeping, he's having these affairs and sleeping with these women and throwing it in my face and and you know her brother ironically wrote, "No, you got to keep this marriage together even if it kills you, uh, oh. but it uh, it won't." So. Uh, um, mm -hmm. But he tried to stage it, uh, look like a, uh, you, you know, people don't know how to stage a crime scene. They, they, or they get it from books and movies and they don't really know. And he tried three different things, I think, to um, make it look like a sex crime. He'd had her pajamas pulled up and her legs spread, but she was not sexually assaulted. Tried to make it look like a burglary, pulled drawers out and stuff, but nothing was missing. And, and uh, then tried to look like a drug crime, his... A uh, little black go bag, his doctor's bag was tipped over and he said ampules of morphine are missing, uh, but nothing else. Uh, and none of that made, you know, made any sense. It wasn't a sexual assault. There's no burglary. And why would a, I mean, how many heroin addicts are there in Bay Village, Ohio, 1954? None. Um, and why not take the whole bag? I mean, why, why, how, how would a guy be able to discern between ampules of morphine and any, anything else? Uh, and then you layer in the victimology. And uh, and uh, as you, we see in these cases, she is brutally bludgeoned. Sam said he interrupted this guy and had two life or death struggles with him. And the only thing Sam got out of it was a black eye. Uh, so again, very inconsistent. Who was the target? Um, Marg uh, uh, his wife was definitely the target of this thing. And especially if it was the handyman, why would the handyman leave him alive? He could identify him. Why not kill Sam uh, if he's in the middle of this violent rage? And Sam had just banged himself in the uh, face and gave, gave himself a black eye. So um, it all came together to me to, you know, to be a staged domestic homicide. And actually, that's what the jury found. And, and the jury uh, was so convinced that two of the jurors said, if this was a criminal trial and Sam was here, we'd give him the death penalty. Uh, wow. That's how strong they were in their uh, opinion about having heard the, uh, heard the evidence. This uh, this case uh, was the basis for a movie. And a TV show. 
a TV show before that. Yeah, The Fugitive was an old TV show uh, and then became the basis for the, it was called The Fugitive, as was the name of the movie that Harrison Ford starred in later. And the whole premise was the guy was wrongly convicted for killing his wife and he was out trying to find the true killer. But in true life, he did kill his wife. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, that's the uh, the reality. Not as sexy as uh, as the movie uh is but uh, that, that's the real story. I guess the uh, the the maintenance guy was the equivalent of the one arm. <clears throat> Excuse me, of the one arm man. Yes, he was the one arm man. You know, the other thing that ruled him up <laughs> is uh, being a good suspect in the uh, um, sexual homicide, uh, which was their theory that he came in to try and rape her, uh, and um, uh, so is that uh, uh, Everling, the handyman, was a lifelong homosexual. And uh, so that kind of wasn't, didn't work. And he had a lot of group sex in prison and, and, and all of that. And he'd been um, um, known to engage in homosexual activity uh, as a youth as, as well. So he's a lifelong homosexual, not the, the kind of guy who has a lust for Maryland. You know, <clears throat> this was before our, my, my, well, I guess I was alive, but, and Ray barely, but <clears throat> this was like, you know, if not the case of the century, Certainly the case of the decade back in the 1950s, <clears throat> which, of course, the TV show The Fugitive started in the early 60s and yes. he escaped from prison, one armed man, all that stuff. Yeah. But that was a big case. Then when Sam got out, he became a professional wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. I remember course. that. Yeah. It's a tragic story altogether. All he came out, he got his uh, medical license back and then killed a woman. Uh, in oh. surgery, he <clears throat> nicked an artery, didn't tell, put her in recovery. She bled to death. So then he got his medical license pulled. Then he became a professional wrestler, killer shepherd. And, uh, but he became an uh, alcoholic, a uh, drug addict, and eventually died in his early 40s due to the addiction. He went through um, uh, three, <clears throat> two more marriages. The last one, the woman left him and said, I'm afraid he's going to kill me. He's very violent. So uh, patterns, patterns. Uh, domestic violence was an, uh, an enduring pattern for, for Sam as well. Yeah. I was at CrimeCon a few years ago in uh, Nashville, and uh, F. Lee Bailey is one of the guest speakers. And uh, I actually had a few moments in the back room before he went on to talk to him. And a uh, nice guy. And I mean, he had his own problems with, I think, alcoholism and yeah. bankruptcy a few times. But yeah. he certainly he was on the O.J., you know, the dream team, the defense lawyers for uh, right. O.J. Simpson. But uh, he certainly made his name on the uh, on the Sam Shepard case, and uh, and uh, the rest is, is history. And here you played a role well after the fact, but an important role nonetheless. So uh, and, interesting uh, again, Greg. Uh, and F. Lee Bailey testified in the civil trial uh, as well in in Cleveland. Um, uh, it, and it, interesting you talk about the alcoholism because there was trial strategy. Steve Dever, the prosecutor, said. I wanted to have his three martini lunch before he gets on the stand. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's how that played out. But, uh, uh, anyway. well-known strategy taught in law school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get your witnesses drunk. The ones you don't want to yeah. come across well. Yeah. So. Right. Tell us, yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit, uh, about your book, uh, the unknown darkness. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I, I tried to put in um, some of the more memorable cases, and we've touched on uh, some of those uh, here in our little time together. Um, uh, actually, I, I had more cases I wanted to put in, but um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, initially I got a contract to, to, to do the book, and Jim, you know how that is. You, you, you've written books. We got a contract to, to, to uh, uh, write a 100,000-word book, and I go, I don't know a hundred thousand words. How am I gonna? How am I gonna? How am I gonna write this book? But it turned out it was just the opposite. I wasn't trying to fill the book; it was trying to edit it down so that you kept the essence of what you were trying to communicate in these chapters and these cases uh, without, you know, with minimum content to keep it focused on the the, the critical parts that you uh, of the case that you were trying to get across, you know, in the book. So, um, so yeah, that became the challenge for me is wasn't filling the book. It was editing it down. So 
uh, so that it still made sense at the end of the day. And I try to get a cross section of these different cases, um, um, you know, some of the active cases with the Bureau. And then I put in the Sam Shepard case as an example of a, um, uh, you know, a civil case where this is, uh, this analysis is brought into play. But then talking about these other cases, how different aspects of profiling was used in these different cases, whether it's uh, the uh, Shepard case or whether it was Shawcross or uh, Unterweger or whatever, they're all different ways that this process is used to, uh, to help uh, get the right answer in these cases. Yeah, and um, profiling it is so much more than just, you know, a white male driving a beat up, you know, Chevy Impala or something like that. Um, and really, it sounds like what you, and a lot of people don't know this, but you know, the goal of a profiler is not to have your analysis on a on an arrest warrant. That would probably never happen or the rarest of the rare. But um, but our goal is to take all the behavioral clues we can and, of course, match them with the forensic evidence and pour, as I like to say, pour everything into a funnel and come out with your suspect, uh, you know, a composite of who your suspect is. And not every single, you know, factor or category will match up exactly but it'll be enough identifiers there that when the police come up with three to five, maybe three to 500 suspects, hey, here's this profiler uh, guy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Greg McCrary, Jim Fitzgerald, Ray Carr, this is what they put together. Let's focus on these couple guys first, right. because that's who, uh, that's who the profiler said. And hopefully if they're experienced and Greg, like what you shared with us, that sounds like what happened in, in a few of the cases that you've right. discussed right. tonight. No, you're exactly right. I mean, it's about, <clears throat> Uh, developing or prioritizing suspects. I mean, um, if you don't have any, maybe we can develop some. If you've got a bunch, well, let's prioritize uh, who 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 most likely fits the profile. Let's start with number one. If we can rule him out. Let's go down to number two. And but it, it's a way of focusing the investigation uh, to hopefully cut short their violent criminal co uh, careers. And what a lot of people also don't know is there's very little that profilers can testify to in court. I think a good profiler can be excellent for an investigation, but it really only comes down to, and I think you mentioned it in uh, in the uh, uh, Unterweger case, basically you did a link linkage analysis yeah. with, with the knots. <clears throat> and that's what I, the one time I've testified to a profiling, uh, uh, in a profiling case, uh, it, it had to do with, uh, you know, signature behavior on the person's part. And that's how you link them. Uh, together. Uh, it, was a, it was a serial rapist. DNA didn't match up all the time. But we, we can't sit in front of a jury. Well, we know it's a, you know, a, a white male that drives this car and he's, you know, five foot eight or something like that. We can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think we would argue that we shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, uh, but we can certainly point investigations in the right way. And as you say, narrow the suspect pool sometime down to, you know, just a few different individuals when they may have hundreds or thousands of uh, of suspects to begin with. And that's, if profiling is done right, uh, not everyone does it right. A lot of people call themselves profilers and uh, we've come across them over the years um, uh, and they're not. Uh, but if, if it's done right, they're trained well with the experience, uh, they can really assist in an investigation and uh, and help resolve it to the very end. Yeah, that that's correct. And then, I mean, back we just talked about the Shawcross case earlier. I mean, I wasn't gonna testify that the guy dumps bodies in the river or any of that stuff. Uh, but that's how we caught him, right? I mean, that, that's the whole idea that you can help move the investigation along. Then, you know, then in that case, the, the officers were able to get uh, basically confession and then a lot of forensic evidence out of the car. And, and there was plenty of evidence and, uh, and I, you know, didn't testify at all. But yeah, profiling testimony per se is not allowed. Not, I agree, I don't think it should be but it's used investigatively and it can be very helpful. It, yeah, it usually is not about uh, how you caught them. It's about what you caught them with, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So it's the profiling aspect is the way is, is kind of the, with the chips on the ground and having you pick up the crumbs till you get to the, to the guy, but it's not important where the crumbs are. It's important once you get there and the forensic evidence. Exactly. <clears throat> Uh, Greg, you've given us some uh, valuable time. We have a couple uh, TV shows coming up. Um, 
maybe we get the actual names and the dates, we can put them out on our website uh, sure. down the line. Um, yep. Again, your book is uh, The Unknown Darkness, Profiling the Predators Among Us. Sounds like there's a book two in there, if not three or four, if you <laughs> yeah. wanted to sit down and do it. Right, you're right. Uh, but um, but coming on podcasts like ours, uh, uh, we, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, Ray, I'll take us out, but any closing words before we go? No, just uh, what a story career, Greg. No, thank you. No, it, it was a privilege. It was a privilege yeah. to have the opportunity to do this kind of work, privilege to work with guys like you as well. So, yeah. And thank you. Thank you for, uh, for blazing the road ahead of Jim and I and uh, allowing us to uh, follow in your footsteps. I mean, yeah, no, wow. So we, we never filled your shoes. No, yeah, yeah. Clown, that's because they're clown shoes. They're very big. You can't. No, 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 no. That's not that's true. They're, so. they're nice uh, wingtips. I remember them well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Or penny loafers when you're off duty, right? There you go. There you go. Uh, well, thanks again, Greg, for coming on Cold Red. Everyone out there, uh, go on our various uh, Cold Red uh, social uh, media sites. Subscribe, like, all those things. Uh, we're also at Cold Red podcast.com. Check us out there for past episodes, future episodes, and uh, and all those types of fun things. So again, uh, as always, thanks to my co-host partner, Ray Carr. And again, our special guest tonight, uh, Greg McCrary. Thanks for coming on board again. And everyone, we will see you next time on Cold Red.